Thank you. Um, one first question, how many of you are familiar with genetic programming? So, okay, there's more people than I, than I thought that there would be. Um, my goal here in this talk is to uh, discuss GP uh, to the public community, to show you some uh, nice success stories for those of you who are not familiar with the technique, to know some of the past success stories, and then to show you some more recent uh, advances and some of our own work that's been mostly focused on academic work, but that I think uh, some of the results are ready to be used now in, in the real world for uh, uh, real applications. So um, here's an overview of my talk. I'm gonna quickly describe what are evolutionary algorithms, what is genetic programming in particular. I'm gonna give you some historical perspective because uh, in machine learning now, neural networks are really one of the main cornerstones of the algorithms, but actually at one point in our history, neural networks and evolutionary algorithms were kind of lumped together. But now in, in machine learning, uh, I think evolutionary algorithms have not really catching up. So that's uh, one of the ideas of these talks. I'm, I'm gonna, for, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with neural nets, so I'm gonna give you some perspectives on their similarities and their differences and also give you some nice, cool success stories for those of you that are interested in this technique to really see what uh, the algorithms are capable of. So here's basically what an evolutionary algorithm is, which is a population-based, gradient-free, meta-heuristic for optimization and search. That's a lot of words. So basically, you want to solve optimization problems or search problems. Evolutionary algorithms are a good tool when gradients are not available. So the, the nice things about these algorithms is they're very domain independent, they're very flexible, very easy way to get you close to an initial solution. They're uh, used mostly as black box uh, optimization algorithms. Uh, the most known algorithm is probably genetic algorithms, but I think the state of the art in black box optimization can really be found with the ref differential evolution, evolutionary strategies, and EDAS, which is uh, estimation distribution algorithms. These are nice algorithms to do numerical optimization when gradients are not available. This is basically the general scheme of every evolutionary algorithm. You have a population of potential solutions. You do some selection based on an objective function or a cost function. We call it a fitness function. We do some search operators, which we call reproduction because evolutionary terminology, but basically search operators in the search space and some survival criteria, and then we just uh, iterate this process. So that's basically what all evolutionary algorithms look like. Uh, one cool thing you can do with them is you can attack multi-objective optimization problems. So here you have a Pareto front where you have two conflicting objectives so you're not looking for one solution you're using, you're looking for a set of solutions. These population-based strategies are a very nice way to solve these kind of difficult um, um, problems where gradient methods will have some difficulties. So uh, now the class of algorithm, of evolutionary algorithm I'm gonna to talk to you about is genetic programming. Genetic programming is basically evolutionary algorithm to evolve uh, com uh, programs, computer programs. Not a full, like uh, you're not gonna evolve a, a, uh, a, a, a full software system, but you can evolve some operators, functions, models, and code segments. Huh? Main features is that you basically express your solutions symbolically, which is gonna be a, 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 a difference with, uh, for example, a, a neural net. And uh, your solutions will be performing some form of computation. Uh, commonly used for supervised learning problems, such as regression classification, program synthesis, automatic programming, and program repair. These are some of the more, more recent topics. And you can do model discovery and design space exploration with this in problems where you're not really sure how to, how to start things off. So here's a quick overview of GP landscape in, in research. You have a lot of types of solution representations, such as syntax trees, graphs, linear programs, networks and grammar-based models. You have a lot, a lot of libraries available in C++, Java, and Python. Actually, the coding library you use is not really that important because since you get symbolic uh, solutions from your search process, you can easily translate those solutions to other implementations. For those of you interested in some academic papers, 
These are the main forums, or for example, the main conferences are Gecko, IEEE, CEC, EvoStar, Folga, EMO, GPTP, just to name a few. Journals, there's, for example, the MIT Press Journal, which is Evolutionary Computation, and IEEE TEC, and then there's a bunch of other journals. So in academia, you have this rich community of people working with uh, evolutionary algorithms and, so, and, and genetic programming, not so much in, uh, in practice. No? So uh, here's, for example, in the 90s and early 2000s, when you heard about the term soft computing or computational intelligence, you would see a taxonomy such as the ones uh, so shown here. So for example, you, when you thought about function approximation and random search, you always get this group together of neural networks and evolutionary algorithms. So the people working in these fields usually think about neural nets and evolutionary algorithms at the same time. Also, for example, you take a look at IEEE Computational Intelligence Society, the group includes evolutionary computation and artificial neural networks. But when you go to machine learning uh, taxonomy or machine learning literature, you always see these guys, but these other algorithms are not so popular yet. And that's actually why we're here. So for example, in the 90s and 2000s, this was an overview of neural nets with regards to generic programming. So neural nets could be trained very efficiently, produce black box models, and the topology was mostly set by hand. When you go to genetic programming, evolution takes longer. Uh, since you're, you're searching for symbolic expressions, it's not so, so fast. That's actually one of the downsides of the, of the techniques. But solutions are potentially interpretable because you get symbolic expressions back from the learning process. And the model structure evolves or is found during the search. So that was kind of the trade-off between neural nets and GP. They, they usually get the same type of performance in those days, but neural nets were faster, but black box. GP was a bit slower, but you could potentially interpret those models. After the deep learning revolution, things have really changed in, in our community. So deep neural networks are achieving state of the art across many domains, can exploit very nicely uh, high performance computing for, with, with CUDA, and are widely used in academia and in industry, and have become um, uh, a, a way to produce many black box models that are easily to, to apply in many domains. Now, generic programming does achieve state of the art uh, in academic problems, but usually in very focused domains, you, you really have to tune the algorithm to your problem, at, but when you do it uh, correctly, you can really get some nice results, as I'm gonna show you. Uh, Syntactic search is, is still much less efficient, and now the difference is much bigger when we're talking about uh, CUDA-based uh, algorithms, uh, are mostly used in academia, but they can still generate these symbolic expressions that are, I think, much nicer than the black box models that you get with neural networks. So I'll give you just a quick overview of success stories with GP for those of you who are not familiar. It all started with this professor right here, is uh, John Koza, when he was working at Stanford University. There's a nice uh, 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 um, um, article published about him in Popular Science in the 90s, where they say John Koza has built an invention machine. John Kosa worked on using GP to evolve the science, and then he took those designs and sent them to the patent office. He believed that if artificial intelligence was going to be uh, a real thing, it, the solutions uh, generated with our AI techniques should be uh, available to get a patent. And he made like uh, over a few dozen uh, patents uh, with designs generated purely by genetic programming, which is the, the technique he's most known for. Here's another cool example by Lee Spector from Hampshire College. He did automatic quantum programming uh, with genetic programming. So this is a really physics uh, problem. No, uh, one of the, the, the main problems with quantum computers is actually programming them. Uh, uh, traditional programmers will have a very hard time coming up with new algorithms for these type of things. And he worked with um, a group of physicists and he was able to evolve several new algorithms uh, for quantum computers purely through uh, genetic programming search. So th th this for me is one of the coolest examples of how to use GP correctly. No, if you ever have a chance to read this book, highly recommend it. And then this one was also an attention grabber in 2004 uh, by uh, some uh, researchers at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, Lawn and, and colleagues. They evolved antennas for a NASA space technology mission 
which was the first evolved structure that went out into space, artificially evolved structure that went out into space. And these designs here are nothing like uh, the designs you would produce by a human engineer, but they actually were much better antennas than the ones by the NASA uh, engineer. So, so this was a cool example from the, from the mid-2000s, which are, are, can give you some ideas of what you can do. Now, so there are some commercial success stories. In fact, uh, Data Robot recently acquired Newtonian, and Newtonian was known for this tool, which is the Eureka tool. And there's a paper, a paper I think, in 2009 by the, the developers of, of, of uh, Eureka, which was published in Science, and basically it's a GP variant. And they did a cool experiment where they uh, live captured a physical phenomena. And from that live motion capture of the physical phenomena, they generated the uh, physical laws that govern that motion. No? So it was a very nice model discovery experiment, and I think led to the success of uh, Newtonian and now Data Robot. Uh, another example is Lantern uh, Financial. They use an algorithm, a data uh, machine learning algorithm they call abstract regression and classification, which is basically just a GP-based regression and classification model. And, uh, and they use it for financial prediction. Evolve Autonetics is another uh, company that uses GP to do data analysis. And, and FFX, th this algorithm by Trent McConaughey, which is fast function extraction. Here is a, com a comparison between some regression techniques, a linear quadratic regression. You have the build time, the average error. FFX was a very nice algorithm published in the GPTP, Genetic Programming Conference. And it's now widely used by like 19 of the 20 type semiconductor companies such as Sony, Nvidia, Qualcomm. They use this algorithm and this is a GP variant that is widely used in industry. For me, it's important for you guys to know this because most of you probably don't know about the GP success stories in, in, in this type of field. Now in our own work, we've been using GP to, uh, for a bunch of real world problems. For These are regression based problems such as um, uh, calculating the, 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 the driving behavior of, uh, of, of, of drivers using GP to model uh, gas turbines, to forecast stock industry prices, to, to uh, analyze EEG uh, recordings. So we're doing this, all of this at the academic level with GP. As I said, that's where it's having a lot of success. But uh, for example, energy prediction we've done with genetic programming, a lot of this work with colleagues from Tijuana and colleagues in Europe, such as uh, the University of Lisbon and the Nova University. Uh, other commercial su success stories of GP you might know of is Teapot for R R R RML. The World Bank is using uh, Teapot to build uh, uh, machine learning pipelines. Google AI has started to, to use evolutionary algorithms and variants of genetic programming, for example, to build automatically uh, deep neural networks. It compares favorably with uh, reinforcement learning techniques. And other companies that are using them are, for example, Uber AI and Sentient. So slowly but surely, evolutionary algorithms and genetic programming are starting to get there. Our work in GP, I'll now I'll show you some examples of the type of work we've done with, uh, by myself and, and Daniel, who is also here and part of our team at ITT and Data Frontier. So for example, we've been using uh, evolutionary algorithms to evolve uh, image operators. This was a cool paper. I, I put this one up because we're so close to, to MIT, where we automate the design of image operators to detect interest points, uh, and also to do image classification, evolving head tracking routines, and doing other uh, type of cool stuff. I, I, I'll show you, for example, an example by Olage and Daniel. Uh, where they have a deep structure similar to a deep neural network, but the filters you use to do the convolution are evolved by GP, and you can get some nice uh, performance, as I'll show you in this video. I hope. Yeah. So there you have some head tracking, and here the the um, um, the the deep structure was totally generated by a, by a GP-based uh, evolution, where you evolve specific convolutional uh, functions for each layer of the of the structure, no? and that's uh, one of the benchmarks for for face tracking. No? Um, another cool example, not done by us, but I think that merits uh, included, was the work by Kelly and Haywood. 
and they did a very nice work. Here is a, a popular uh, problem for, for learning uh, benchmarking, which is the Atari game playing. And here they compared with a deep uh, re um, reinforcement uh, neural network, uh, HNET, which is a firm of evolution algorithm for neural networks, and their new proposal, which is called Tangled Program Graphs. And the first cool thing is that that outperformed the deep neural network on many of the games. So that's nice. But I think the most interesting part are the size of the, of the programs that are evolving. So for example, in comparison with a deep neural network, which in, in this case are 800,000 different uh, connection weights, this is the graph that controls the program that outperforms those deep neural network guys. So if you want to use this in a real life setting, this, this program is much more efficient. And plus, it has the potential of actually understanding what's going on during the program execution, which is completely evolved. Uh, to finalize the talk, I'll show you an area that I think has a lot of promise, which is called automatic software improvement or automatic software repair, which is a, a basically software improvement through search. So basically what you want to do is to optimize some functional property of your code uh, uh, I mean, to keep some uh, functional property, but optimize a non-functional property. So for example, you want to increase uh, um, uh, or, or reduce the runtime or reduce energy consumption or other aspect of the algorithm. And one of the strengths is that you can reuse a lot of code that's already available and then automatically improve that code and expand your search space by integrating the, this type of tools. So this is a work I did with one of my PhD students and a collaborator from the University of Bordeaux, Perric Legrand. And basically the idea is, as I showed you before, this is the loop of an evo a classical evolutionary algorithm. We start with a source, a source code that we want to improve, and then we uh, translate this to a BNF grammar. This technique was first developed by Bill Langdon and Mark Harmon. Bill Langdon is at UCL and Harmon is now, I think, at Facebook. And then uh, your population is basically a series of modifications you can do on your original source code. So you have a population of edits to your source code, you do your search operators, and then you have modified versions of your sor uh, source code. You have to have a test set of prop of, uh, uh, for your software, and basically these test sets give you your objective function. You iterate this, and at the end you have a new source code for your system that you want to optimize. And I think this will be better shown with an example. So our work has been done on applying this technique to the SLAM problem. I don't know if you're familiar with SLAM problem. Basically, if you put a robot in an unknown environment, the robot has to make a map of the environment and to localize itself within that environment. So this is basically what a SLAM algorithm would look like. In fact, this is the Kinect Fusion algorithm, which been, has been along for a few years. And you have there, you, that line is the, the trajectory of the robot, and those points uh, represent the 3D map of the robot within the, that environment. Uh, in fact, you don't need a robot to do SLAM, you can do it basically with just a handheld camera that you move around the room. Now, uh, we took an existing system, which is the Connect Fusion system, and here you will see the following. You, we have two scenarios here. Uh, on the right, you have the original Kinect Fusion algorithm, uh, and on the left, you have the improved version. By improved version, I mean a, a version that was completely, uh, all of the, the modifications done to this version of algorithm were completely automated and completely done by an evolutionary algorithm, a GP-based algorithm. And here you will see first that the frame rate of this version is much faster, and the other you will see is that the original version uh, uh, fails in this, in this algorithm. I think that, that there's a, a memory error at some point, but the improved version does not uh, has this, uh, this issue. And uh, for, for us, I think this has a very nice potential. And in fact, it's being initially used in, in some domains. So you can see here the 3D reconstruction of the, of the room. And you can see again the improved version moving uh, much fa at a faster frame rate. And then you will see this guy here, it uh, just uh, locks up and it cannot continue. And then you have to basically uh, stop the, the, <coughs> the, the process. And this one goes on till the end. No? 
uh, this one is now much uh, uh, faster. Now, in fact, the improvement that the latest version we have is like 60% uh, improvement in terms of uh, efficiency. All of that done automatically. So I think I'm close to the time limit. I'll, I'll skip to the final um, slide of our talk. Uh, again, our, our goal for this talk was for the Poppies community to more about, know more about GP and evolutionary computation. Uh, it's, it's very cool to be next to Data Robot and, and, and their work uh, with uh, uh, Newtonian and the Eureka tool. Uh, we also believe uh, on this type of modeling process. Uh, we want to make sure you know that GP is a very versatile par uh, uh, paradigm. As I showed you, uh, commercially it's being used on regression, and classification, automatic modeling, but in academia it's been used to evolve uh, uh, quantum computing algorithms and to do automatic software improvement without any human intervention. And of course, we are interested in new and challenging real world problems in machine learning and trying to solve those problems with GP. Uh, here are our contact emails. Uh, the other guy that's responsible for this talk is Daniel, which is over there. And that's basically, thank you. <laughs>